So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to start off. We thought we would start off the first of the series with sort of some basics for what should you plant in your pasture? Um, talk about a couple of different things. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, you can also feel free to unmute and, and ask questions as well if you would like to. And we have a few more people join us, which is great. So what should you plant in your pasture? Let me get switched over here. So some different things you might wanna consider is what species of critters are you gonna grow? Um, are you going to have some steers, some heifers or something that's behind Brooke there watching her, waiting to see if they can join in on our, our webinar? Sheep, goats, horses like I had in the first picture. Um, the livestock species that you have will really help determine what type of plants you might wanna plant in your pasture. The other big thing that you would wanna try and determine is do you have any water source available? So, and if you guys get a chance, pop in the chat if you have irrigated pasture or if you just have annual rangelands, if you don't have any extra water source. If you have a water source, it could be coming from um, riparian rights, um, a river or a creek running by the property. It could be from a well, um, or we have a lot of irrigation districts here in my county, so a lot of people have their small acreages um, providing from a water district. Cost would be another big thing. Goals of the pasture and the seeds, you know, what type of seeds you wanna plant. There's some um, seeds that would be fairly cheap and inexpensive and will establish well. Um, or you could have different goals and maybe you spend more money on it. Um, cost could also be on the type of infrastructure you use for your irrigation if you have access to irrigation. Cost could be on the infrastructure you set up in your pasture for rotational grazing or set stock grazing. So there would be different costs um, we can talk about as well. And then of course, soil characteristics. Are there any certain characteristics where it might make one species of forage better or worse to plant in a pasture than another? So we're gonna to touch on a little bit of that. I didn't touch as much on the cost. Um, I'm hoping maybe that can be more of a discussion for everybody once we get through the slides. So the first thing, the basic thing is you basically have two choices of forages, whether they're, it's a grass or a legume. Legumes being primarily clovers, birds fit trefoil, which is this picture down here on the bottom corner, or maybe even plant some alfalfa in your pasture versus grasses um, that would be primarily more if you wanted to have um, more horses in there, you may not want the, the legumes. So talking about grasses, and I hate Zoom, especially since we asked you guys to turn off cameras, I can't. So Brooke, your face, I'm gonna be picking off you to see if I'm going too fast, too slow, since I can't see anybody else's pictures, anybody else's faces. Grasses, we have two basic types of um, growth habitat, whether it's a bunch grass or a sod forming grass. Bunch grasses are gonna be things in pastures like tall fescue, um, orchard grass and perennial rye grass would all be bunch grasses. So you're gonna have a clump of, um, of a grass growing and then some bare space around it. It won't be full um, grass throughout the whole pasture. You'd have a little bit of space in between it. Whereas the sod forming grasses, you can think of like um, Bermuda grass where they're gonna have stolons. So stolons, if you don't know what that is, think of um, strawberries and you have the runners that the plant sends out. Um, above ground to start new plants or the rhizomes, which would be the tillers running under the ground to, um, to start a new plant. The sod forming grasses will fill in much faster and have less bare ground in between, in between the plants compared to the bunch grasses. Um, picking which one might be a, um, a personal preference. Some of the ranchers I work with on their irrigated pastures, they don't want bunch grasses because they would like to be able to drive across their pasture in their quad or their um, side by side and have it be a smooth ride. Uh, they don't like the bumps that they get from their tall fescues. So they prefer more of a sod forming grass. The other thing with gr um, grasses that's important to keep in mind is how they're gonna be regrown. So as we're grazing these with different livestock species, there's two basic form, um, forms of regrowth from grasses, either jointed or non-jointed. And you can get my finger here. So you can think of my, um, my knuckles as the joints. So a jointed grass is gonna be growing tall and where I have my, oops, my virtual screen. My joint, if this is the growing, growing point, if we come and graze that and clip off the tip of that, 
that grass now has to take longer to regrow because it has to grow more tillers from the base of the plant to elongate to grow um, to grow more. So grazing a little bit heavy will um, slow it down in your grass production and you'll have less um, productive field. Whereas with the non-jointing grass, it doesn't have this joint part for where it's gonna be regrowing. All of the growth is gonna be coming from the bottom of the plant, from, um, from tillers gonna be coming to the bottom. So a common non-jointing grass would be orchard grass in pastures and a common jointed grass would be like a rye grass. Um, both of them can also have different um, considerations based on the timing you would graze. Jointed grasses, you would wanna wait and defer grazing maybe until it starts to go into its reproductive stage so that you have more tillers already established at the base of that plant. So when an animal does come by and graze it, you can regrow a lot faster than if you um, had less tillers at the base of the plant. The non-jointing grass, um, the orchard grass and, and such, that one can take a lot more pressure from grazing. So you can graze it much lower in the pasture than you would want to for your jointing grasses. And between grasses and legumes, for the most part, um, grasses will tolerate much poorer soil conditions than legumes will, but they definitely need nitrogen to be applied during the, during the growing season. So, Here's some pictures, and I know it's a little bit fuzzy on the stages of growth, but I wanted to try to touch base on it. So for us to have the most production out of our forages, we really wanna keep them in this vegetative stage of growth. Um, so we mentioned for the jointed grasses, as they're starting to go into the reproductive stages, the early ones, this would be when you would want to try to graze them because you would have more tillers at the base of the plant to be able to regrow. So coming through here and nipping off this top part leaves your, um, your bud here able to, to regrow and keep, keep going. Your jointed ones would have um, more tillers going and would be able to, to withstand that regrowth. So our jointed grasses, you might have these different nodes coming up. As it hits the reproductive stage, you're gonna have more nodes. So that's why it allows you for um, more opportunity to come and graze it without taking off that growth point. Legumes, unlike grasses, they can fix nitrogen, which is the benefit from them. And because of that, they also tend to be higher in crude protein, um, which make it great for any livestock, any ruminants especially. Um, for horses, it tends to be a little bit too much of a, a hot feed, a little bit too much um, protein, which I think Brooke will talk about a little bit later, um, but be great for finishing any, any livestock on. We have two basic growth habitats, habits, sorry, um, whether it's prostate to growing low to the ground, like birds that trefoil, or um, some sanophones might grow a little bit taller and upright. And unlike the grasses where we have jointed or non-jointed, our growth from our legumes are gonna be auxiliary growth. So whether they grow, think again of that strawberry as it's moving out, um, here in the picture on the top of the clover here, you have a new growth um, bud at the flower on the stem versus the crown, so like a red clover, the growth point is all gonna be coming from the base of the plant of the crown. And then alfalfa can grow from both. So it has an advantage um, to try and withstand grazing because it can grow from multiple multiple growth points. So another thing to think of and keep in mind, um, I know we have some people that have registered from across the world, which is great. Um, so hopefully most of this should also apply for where you're at as well. But here in California, we talk about um, our cool season grasses and our warm season grasses. Um, cool season grasses tend to be C3s. Warm season will be all of our C4s. Bermuda grass would be a great Dallas grass or some um, common irrigated pasture plants. It would be warm season grasses. Our legumes tend to be sort of in between production from both the cool and warm season where they do start a little bit slower in the spring to grow. Um, they peak probably about mid to late spring and then they don't drop as much as our cool season grasses do. Um, we refer to that here as our summer slump. So our cool season grasses will give us that nice good growth um, early in the year as we're coming onto our irrigated pastures off of our annual rangelands here, especially where I'm at. And those you can think of as annual ryegrass, um, perennial ryegrass for sure. 
And then some of our more warm season grasses, again, the Bermuda grass, the Dallas grass, um, fescue, tall fescue does really well as a warm season grass. So knowing what species you have, you can plan to make sure you have forage for um, the entire growth season. So some of our seeding mixes, and Brooke, am I going too fast or am I okay? Okay, perfect. I hate Zoom because I can't read, it, read the crowd. Um, if you have a horse, the biggest thing for helping you determine what you should plant in your pasture is the activity level. I've had a lot of people over the years that um, they have probably every intention of, of riding their horse on a regular basis, but life gets in the way and the horse might get out once a week, maybe once every couple of weeks. And their pasture, of course, was just planted to this general livestock mix down here on the bottom, which has a mix of some clovers and some grasses. And um, they were coming and asking what low glycemic grasses they should plant because their horses were getting fat. They had too much protein in their diet and they weren't working to need that intake. Um, a lot of us, I'll speak for myself, I had similar situation with COVID. I think a lot of us can relate to there. We weren't exercising as much as we used to be. And we might've been stuck in our house where um, sweeter treats were easier to get a hold of. So really trying to, to match your animal's needs with what you put in that pasture. So horses, unless you're really working them like every day, probably just a plain grass mix would be sufficient for horses. Um, tall fescue is one that if you're gonna plant it specifically with horses in mind, you wanna ensure that it's endophyte free. Most of the seed that you would purchase is gonna be certified endophyte free. Um, the endophytes can have a toxic um, problem specifically with horses, but with, with all livestock in general. If you have um, just an, want an all purpose mix, Again, just a combination of some different um, grasses. So we've got annual ryegrass and perennial ryegrass to give some good early forage growth and then orchard grass for that later summer growth. So the combination of these three grasses, all three of them are very palatable. So it tends to make it fairly easy to manage your pasture and not have one grass species get ahead of the others and become um, what we might call rank or um, too much lignin in it and not as palatable. And then down here in the bottom, if you've got um, any livestock, you're wanting to try to um, finish any cattle off um, and you want some extra protein, definitely adding some clover. The Selena strawberry clover um, or trefoil would be the ones to, to probably plant more than a white clover because they typically are less bloat resistant. And if you had primarily sheep or goats, you know, there are other species you could think of that would be um, more of a broadleaf, um, such as some, um, um, oh, I'm blanking on it, um, brassicas would be something you could plant for, for goats and sheep that would do really well on. Um, plantain tends to come in naturally in some pastures and would be great food protein and, and good for broadleaf. So, if your eyes are anything like mine, this is not an easy um, chart to read, but we will be posting this on the, the website that we are in the process of finishing creating. Um, on here, I try to put some of the more common varieties that we would see and how hardy they are. How well are they gonna um, to stand up to, um, to grazing pressure? Um, do they stand up for, um, for winter cold hardiness? Would they still be persistent in there? Um, how long do you typically see them in irrigated pasture? Um, how much production would you expect to get from them? And then of course, the biggest thing is how palatable are they? If they can produce a lot of feed out there in your pasture, but they're not very palatable, it does not make any sense to, to select that species um, if for your pasture. And then we also have um, you know, the, the palatability of the quality. So it might be highly palatable, but maybe there's not a lot of quality to it. And so we can go through and contrast and um, see what would work best for you. And then we've also got on here the pH range. So if you've got acidic soils um, or alkaline soils, you can have a range of, of um, forages to choose from. And then some other characteristics on here to take into consideration when you're picking something. And again, these we're focusing more on for the irrigated pastures. If you've got annual rangeland, um, but you want to do something with, we could talk about that afterwards. So picking up a few of these really quickly, 
Um, orchard grass, as I mentioned, is a typical one here in the San Joaquin Valley, Northern San Joaquin Valley. It's more, um, it's typically, I think, technically a C3 plant, but it will do better through our summer slump than our perennial ryegrass. Um, it, advantage of it, um, it's really good quality. It regrows really well. This is a non-jointed grass, so it puts out a bunch of tillers so that it can come up faster. Um, it tends to establish pretty well. If you've got some trees in the pasture for shade, it's shade tolerant, so that helps um, helps you give you some benefit there. One of the problems, the things would be, um, is if it's on a continuous grazing because it is palatable, you might see it starting to um, to disappear out of your pasture. So having more of a rotational grazing process with orchard grass would be beneficial. Annual ryegrass, um, again, this one is super easy to establish and it'll establish from seed as long as it is allowed to go to seed. Um, it can tolerate really good close grazing, so you don't have to worry so much. It's not a jointed grass for that one. Um, good quality again, this is gonna give you your early feed. So for a lot of my ranchers on a normal year, not this year, but on a normal year, they're probably coming out um, of their annual rangelands, of the foothills, onto irrigated pasture somewhere between mid-April and mid-May, probably close to that mid-May. And so there will be a lot of annual ryegrass ready to go in that pasture for them to start while they're waiting for some of your other grasses um, that are a little bit for um, later in the summer to really get established and growing. Disadvantages is that because it's an annual grass, it does not like the heat. So even though it's an irrigated pasture, at a certain point, it's just going to be done and it's going to go to seed and be out of the pasture. Um, unlike orchard grass that likes the shade, this one does not. So if you've got a, a heavy tree cover in your pasture, um, annual ryegrass would probably disappear over time faster than some of your others. Tall fescue, oops, did I skip? Oh, I did skip one, sorry. Perennial ryegrass, um, also very easy to establish, um, similar to the annual ryegrass good quality on it as well. It also does um, do good with, with close grazing. So more of a continuous grazing, it will tolerate more than the orchard grass. And again, this being a perennial, it will last longer in your pasture than your annual ryegrass, but it will start to die off um, in that summer slump as the temperatures start to heat up in probably June, late June and early July. So tall fescue, um, I mentioned that earlier, you can see here it's a really good bunch grass. So you can see you have space between your bunch grasses. Um, it has good quality and some of the plant breeders have been coming up with new varieties that are finer leaf and more palatable, which helps. Um, one thing with this is because it is a later um, plant, it'll be more um, summer, summer feed. It can be ignored for more palatable plants early in the season and it can get ahead of the livestock. Um, so having a rotational grazing program really helps with this one to try and keep it in that growth stage and actively growing and more palatable. And then again, making sure that it is endophyte free for um, reducing your toxicity. So that was a few plants really quick to try to highlight and go over. Um, fertilization. So irrigated pastures, a lot of times normally are not fertilized just because the cost of, of putting out the fertilizer. But if you're really trying to push your pasture and raise as many livestock on it as you can, having some extra fertilizer really will help and give you more production. The best thing to do is to have a soil test done and find out what you are lacking. There's no point in going out and applying something and spending money on something that your pasture doesn't need. So determine what it is that you need. There are probably um, a handful of labs scattered about, probably fairly close to you that you could send your samples into. Um, if not, we can, I'm sure Julie will probably work on putting a, um, a list of different labs scattered about the state that you can also, also mail things into if need be. The biggest thing um, I think I've seen people in my area do, especially with nitrogen, is if you go and apply it all at the beginning of the season, nitrogen moves very fast with your water. And if you are in an irrigated pasture, you put on the whole amount of nitrogen your pasture needs for the summer. And within probably two irrigations, majority of that nitrogen that you paid money for has leached down into your water table and it is not available for your grasses. Um, so you're wasting money. So 
decline, the your fertilizer is scattered throughout the season. Um, maybe every other irrigation, depending on how much fertilizer you need, will help you not waste any um, any of your money that you're applying, as well as keep all those nutrients in and available for your for your forages. And with fertilizer, if you've got a lot of legumes in your pasture, you have to really balance that nitrogen that you're applying, the more nitrogen you apply, you're gonna have your grasses outcompete your legumes and your legumes are gonna have a higher protein um, for your livestock. So you wanna keep that in mind. So mine is skipping here. Um, really quickly to talk about grazing management, um, basically continuous grazing versus rotational grazing. So these are two irrigated pastures. Um, this one is not in my area, we pulled that from, from Reno. So a continuously managed pasture, continuously grazed, you're gonna to start to see a lot of areas that are be going to become fair ground just because livestock can continuously go back to it. They can be very selective and pick their favorite plants. So can think about the traditional um, analogy we use as a salad bar. And you're gonna continuously probably go back to the dessert portion of the salad bar more than, I like Brussels sprouts, more than maybe the Brussels sprouts section. So you'll see a lot of plants that will be overgrazed and a lot of plants undergrazed. Um, so while it's very easy to do, you don't need as much infrastructure, it can really reduce how much forage production you're getting out of your pasture. Whereas rotational grazing, you can keep all of your plants in a higher growth form in that vegetative stage, so they are a better quality forage, but it does require a lot more effort on your part and um, infrastructure. And I would challenge, even if you only have two acres, you can still set up a rotational grazing system to try and manage your pasture. Um, it's not out of the question. You just have to be a little more creative in how you set it up. So, and so the last couple of things I wanna to touch about um, is if you are irrigating, when do you know when it's time to irrigate? This is probably the hardest thing to try and determine, um, but it's sort of critical to make sure you keep your plants in an active growing stage to make sure that they keep that adequate water. So the rule of thumb is to always irrigate when your available water holding capacity is about 50%. But looking at your pasture, how can you decide that? If you wait until you start seeing plants wilting, you've already passed that point and you may or may not get your plants to bounce back. So what are some ways you can do this? And here is a graph looking at, um, depending on your soil textures, sandy to, to clay, Clay soils are going to have a much bigger water holding capacity than your sandy soils. So sandy soils, you're going to have to irrigate more often than your clay soils. Um, and having that a spot over here more of like a silty or clay loam would give you a lot more water um, holding capacity. So available water, once you first irrigated, you're going to have saturated soil. So all these air pockets are going to be completely full of water not ideal to have that situation on a long-term basis. Some irrigated pastures, if you see, they might have an area in the soil, area in the pasture, maybe towards the bottom of the pasture where you're gonna see water standing for multiple days. And what you typically will see happen is you'll change from your desirable species in your pasture to plant species that are gonna be more um, tolerant of, um, of the standing water. So rushes or um, sedges, which are not as palatable to livestock. You really wanna have these, these air particles in here um, for your the grasses we want. So this would be sort of a field capacity. Plants are able to pull up that water. When you get down to this permanent wilting point is when the plants are no longer able to hold water. And that's when you're gonna to start to see the wilting of your plants. So a couple of different ways you can try to determine what your um, water holding capacity is, if you need to irrigate or not. Really simple way is the look and feel method. Pretty much take your shovel, whether it's a, a small little garden shovel or something bigger, dig a small hole and look and feel what the texture is of that soil. Does it feel like it's starting to dry out or is it still um, pretty moist? And NRCS has a lot of fact sheets on this Natural Resource Conservation Service. And we'll make sure on our website to link to some of these to, to give you some more information. My other favorite one is the screwdriver method. Um, I have always had a large screwdriver, you know, a good foot long screwdriver, not the ones I would use around the house, just for the purpose of when I go out to pastures to be able to do what this gentleman is doing and you just stick it down into your pasture. The harder it is to get into the pasture, the drier your pasture is. If you can easily put that screwdriver 12 inches down, 
then you probably still have some good soil moisture. But this can be a super easy way of going out there and trying to see how much um, water there is and if it's time to irrigate or not. The last one is to actually use some weather information. So in California, we have um, CMIS. It's our California Irrigation Management System that are scattered about. Um, they are all on pastures or grasses that are managed. Um, this is just not the correct one. I wasn't able to find an actual CMIS picture, um, but they're kept on, on green grass throughout the summer and they record everything, temperature, evapotranspiration rate from that pasture. And you can use the SEMA station data, find the one closest to you, and use that to be able to calculate how much um, irrigation water you need to be applying. So you can use that. The other method you can use for irrigating, um, depending on where you're at, some of the irrigation districts in my area call ranchettes, um, small two to 10 acre places, garden districts, and your irrigation schedule is set at the beginning of the year. Um, for some of them, it's every three weeks. And whether or not you need more water, if it's a hotter summer, it's every three weeks and you don't have a choice. So depending on what your situation is, you might be able to use something as sophisticated as a SEMA station, or you might just be on a set um, irrigation schedule dictated by the irrigation district.